we are here together in order to do something about the standstill in the homeland debate. So we are at present in a fairly absurd situation that there is ever more evidence accumulating against the Aryan invasion theory, and yet it makes no impact whatsoever. I've just last year been in three different uh, conferences of specialists in this field. One is general linguistics conference in Oxford, one a uh, general orientalist conference in Berlin, and one very specifically Indo-Europeanist conference about the homeland question in Leiden. This last was, was a, a very good conference, very focused, and it was organized because many people in the field were starting to realize that the Yamnaya homeland, the pit grave culture homeland, which is in Ukraine and uh, southwest Russia, that that could not be the original homeland. From the vantage point of Europe, it is the homeland, in the sense that there was a dramatic invasion into Europe in the early 3rd millennium BC, very well attested genetically and archaeologically. It's exactly what an Aryan invasion should look like. And so that is not controversial. All this has happened in Europe. It's well attested. The uh, evidence is again also accumulating, is becoming ever more, ever more solid. But nevertheless, if in Europe they came from Ukraine, they didn't ultimately come from Ukraine. So that was also a settlement area of people coming from somewhere else. Now where from? Some people say from Anatolia. In the 1990s, this was an important homeland candidate, but it has lost the race. Most scholars now are in agreement that it can't have been Anatolia. The uh, Hittite language spoken there, the Indo-European languages that made it to that particular area, uh, have all the hallmarks of being immigrant. And um, so, at the moment, nobody looks for the homeland exactly there. Well, a few still do, like uh, one of the great... Um, promoters of the idea that the Yamnaya culture was only a secondary homeland is the linguist Paul Haggerty. He still defends Anatolia as the homeland. Then you have heard certainly in 2018 of the geneticist David Reich from Harvard, who uh, is being quoted in India as supporting a Yamnaya homeland. Well, maybe in his view, people came into India from Yamnaya, but before that, they came from an earlier homeland, which he locates in northern Iran, not in Europe, by the way, which means that there are no native languages in Europe because Basque is an immigrant language from the Northwest Caucasus, and Uralic is an immigrant language coming from Siberia, and Indo-European, well, according to, um, according to some scholars, it came from either Anatolia or Iran, and I personally hold a third opinion, but so, at any rate, not from the Yamnaya culture, which was only a secondary homeland. So this much is admitted. You see, there is something moving. Yet, nobody there 
took the out of India theory seriously. In fact, quite a few people there had never even heard of it. And those who had heard of it had also been put off and had been motivated never to delve into it because they had vaguely heard that it was politically tainted. And so there were 30 papers very focused on this homeland question. Only three mentioned Sanskrit, and only one of those three mentioned the out of India theory in one sentence, you know, saying that it exists, that it's one of the candidates for homeland. And then the next sentence was, but most scholars don't accept this, which is true. Well, at least most scholars in the West. And so we're not getting anywhere. <laughs> and uh, well, me, I was the only person there who, you know, stood by the out of India theory. I had the very good fortune of talking to some of the topmost uh, Indo-Europeanists and to David Reich, uh, who was a very nice man. Only I think that he's mistaken if he thinks that he has genetically identified the population that brought the Indo-European languages, especially Sanskrit, into India. Well, um, so far, of course, we are not making any headway. Um, nowadays, thanks to, uh, thanks to Sangam, for example, there are many very good videos on YouTube that anybody can, uh, can look at uh, without paying anything even. And, you know, they're just, just right close to you, just one mouse click and, and you're watching it. And you don't have to walk to the library or download passwords of uh, the JSTOR library or whatever. It's right there, and yet it's not making any impact. It's, uh, it's all preaching to the converted, what we have done for all these years. And quite a few people uh, still still go public with titles like uh, The Myth of the Aryan Invasion. Mm. You see, <laughs> I, mean, I, I heard talks like that 25 years ago, and, you know, at the time it was interesting, but by now it gets a bit... I mean, it's all just... Uh, just... Uh, turning around in circles, it's not going anywhere. And yet it ought to be fairly easy. You see, the, um, the Aryan invasion theory at this moment has, in fact, in terms of arguments of what is really known to archaeologists, to, um, to liter literary scholars, even to geneticists, um, is is known to become weak, you see, to be a, be attacked from all sides, and yet sociologically it's totally the same. You know, nobody in there feels threatened. Oh my God, you see, our theory is, uh, you know, is is going to be toppled. No, they have no such consciousness at all. So. Um, Today we hope to make a little contribution towards uh, a move in this field and to um, get the other side to listen to us. Now in this connection uh, we have a few important speakers and one of these is Gigi Nadumuri Ravi. I understand that his family name is Nadumuri and that Ravi is some addition. So, you see, Dr. Nadu Muri is a, a space uh, scientist, literally a rocket scientist. You know, some people say that this, uh, this Aryan invasion business is not rocket science. Well, nevertheless, we brought a rocket scientist. In, in India, most... Um, philosophers and historians and so on of a certain caliber 
have first studied uh, engineering or so, mostly to please their parents. And then after having pleased their parents, then they can, you know, do the thing that they wanted to do. Now, uh, one good thing about this is that people from the exact sciences, they learn a certain intellectual rigor. And people from the humanities, you know, that, you know, they're good at sloppy thinking. And so, when I just reviewed his, uh, his new book about the geography of the Ramayana, I noticed, you see, so many things like really fall into place where so many so-called history rewriters make a whole mess of it. Um, you know, this, this has a virtue, you know, these, uh, all these former engineers turned historians, it's a good thing. So, um, he has first written a book about the geography of the Rig Veda, now one on the Ramayana, and by next year we will enjoy his book about the geography of the Mahabharata. And he ties these three in together. For the Veda and the Mahabharata is not so surprising, because they are about the same dynasty, the Bharata dynasty, as the, the, the backbone of the world of the Vedic issues. And so within that dynasty, you get a war of succession, which is the subject matter of the Mahabharata. But uh, the Ramayana, he also links to those, and he shows the place of Rama in the Rig Veda, and um, the, um, the link between Rama and the Mahabharata battle. And in fact, uh, there's, there's one thing, Jijit, that I find so stunning that I really have to tell everyone. This is not to tell you, oh, you don't need the book because here is the secret. No, no, it means on the contrary. You have to read the book in detail to know how he came to these conclusions. But so one really surprising thing in there is that Rama lived only three generations before Krishna. So that means that the Dvapara Yuga, you know, that has Krishna at the end of it, and that starts only after Rama, who is the Tretaka Thakur, okay, that that lasts only three generations. So it's not 432,000 or a multiple of that. No, it's just 100 years. Isn't that strange? Um, anyway, but so that this just, you know, to give an idea of how uh, stern logic leads him to unexpected places. So um, about our subject matter of today, um, he also has done some very original findings. And I think now it is time to go listen to that. Gigi, it's up to you. So uh, thanks to uh, Dr. Conrad as for a very wonderful introduction to this talk and to me. And uh, I am also very thankful for the Sangam talks for this particular conference. I have already done two talks uh, which was uh, focusing on the Mahabharata and also the compar comparative analysis of uh, different Kurukshetra war dates uh, that are uh, in the form of Sangam. Uh, in the last uh, few years, I think 2017 or uh, 20 like that. This is uh, the the third time I'm uh, invited to this auspicious uh, forum of uh, Sangam, and definitely with a lot of uh, push from Dr. Conrad Elst, who said like I have to come to Delhi and uh, have this uh, deliver this talk and uh, show some of the uh, findings which may be very much relevant to the question of foreign innovation and its reputation that is out of India theory. So that is where I am here and I am seeing a very uh, auspicious and curious audience and it makes me tremendously happy. So just uh, maybe without much shadow, I just move the slides 
as uh, k has mentioned i have uh, started my career i mean not as a scientist but as a game developer in bangalore and then i switched for uh, into isro uh, based on an interview and uh, i was very much fortunate to be part of the chandrayaan one study phase where i was uh, fortunate to meet dr apj abdul kalam and get uh, uh, some appreciation for from him for the some software i have developed it's using game engines i have developed a software for the orbital uh, the lunar orbit study that is uh, gso to lto orbit transit that is uh, basically to bring the uh, the lunar uh, the spacecraft uh, from the earth bound orbit to the moon bound orbit so that is called uh, this uh, gto to lto lunar transit Uh, that is that is where i have worked in isro and then uh, got some good uh, words from the uh, dr apj he was not yet president of that, that time just 9 days before he became the president <laughs> so that's the story and then uh, i am uh, currently um, as a software professional i work and then uh, fortunate to author two books Uh, as uh, dr k mentioned one is uh, the rivers of rigveda uh, is primarily into the geography of uh, rigveda and then uh, the geography of ramayana that is the second part of a trilogy and i am try currently writing the the third part of it that is the uh, geography of mahabharata which is supposed to be released in the next year uh, somewhere around january so that's uh, so here uh, is the the three books as i mentioned uh, i am also doing the cover design of the book so i i have the capability to uh, show what how the the third book look like and that's what you are seeing in the slide which is not yet published it's coming in the 2024 january so now i'm coming to the the main topic so i these are the couple of slides uh, so that uh, what i what i talk subsequently makes some sense and i think this particular slide is familiar to anybody who has gone through shrikant talgari's uh, books uh, he has written th- uh, three wonderful books which is the foundation of uh, uh, whatever my research into rigveda as well as into uh, ramayana and uh, mahabharata because the primary chronological sequencing of the the 10 mandalas of rigveda he has done so uh, just giving an introduction and a refresher for anybody who was already familiar with uh, the internal chronology that uh, talgari has uh, explain very detail in his book so we have it's uh, the the mandalas from 1 to 10 are not the exact sequence of the numbers uh, we have 6 3 and 7 that is 6 3 and 7th mandalas this uh, the early rigvedic period where you have uh, mention of uh, kings like divodasa uh, sudas uh, like that uh, some kings rigvedic kings who are part of the early rigveda and you have a uh, middle rigvedic uh, period where you have sahadeva and somaka the uh, the descendants of sudas uh, they are mentioned as contemporary into this period and when you go uh, much more further like uh, like after fourth second and uh, the starting with the fifth uh, it is uh, considered as late rigvedic uh, mandalas fifth eighth ninth and tenth so eighth ninth and it is a sequence but others are not and uh, some of the additional information that i have used to connect rigveda with the mahabharata and of course with ramayana that i will discuss is that mention of shantanu and devapi in the 10th mandala of the rigveda and uh, this uh, shantanu and De- uh, devapi we know that in mahabharata they are in the fifth generation or the fourth generation of the pandavas so that ancestor of the pandavas are there is mentioned in the 10th mandala of rigveda that is the connecting link and so uh, then you have the subsequently the kurukshetra war and aftermath so um, this is the below uh, timelines i have shown it is the uh, slightly uh, i mean it's just uh, 90% similar to talgari's chronology but uh, towards the end in the 1900 bc uh, that is because of the uh, shantanu's presence in the 10th mandala i have uh, considered the ending of the uh, this uh, late rigvedic period in the 10th mandala at 1900 bc but otherwise it's the same so we have uh, the rigvedic period 3000 bc to 1900 bc uh, and uh, some of the 
very early kings which who are even mentioned as ancient kings even in the early part of the rigveda like uh, the personalities like manu ila uh, pururavas ayus nakusha yayati so all of them are like much older than 3300 bc so rigvedic period that is a like the composition period starting with 3300 bc doesn't mean that our tradition or culture is starting with 3300 bc so basically you have uh, manu can be dated uh, 4000 bc or beyond even because if you think about some uh, gaps in the lineage he can be like 8000 bc or 7000 bc which is very correspond to the virana that is the one of the oldest archaeological site in haryana close to the river saraswati so this all matching up so that's one point and towards the left hand side uh, you have uh, dating of kuru at around 2000 bc and uh, here actually 1000 years before like uh, sudas and others at 3000 bc etc and you have shantanu and rama the two connecting link which connects uh, mahabharata and uh, ramayana with rigveda uh, they can they are both mentioned as contemporary in the 10th mandala so they can be dated to 1920 bc and kurukshetra war at uh, 1793 90, bc which is a, a astronomy based date coming from uh, the archaeo astronomers so i will explain it in detail subsequently and of course this particular analysis uh, goes deeper uh, like at, uh, instead of uh, stopping at mandala level uh, my book is also focusing on the him uh, that is sukta level uh, some of the suktas mentioned as uh, in the late even in the early rigvedic period so whenever you do a chronological analysis you should be very careful about uh, such suktas which are in the early rigvedic period which are late Uh, so there are two sources for defining which is the la- late in the early uh, rigvedic period that is the aitreya brahmana which is listing the late uh, relatively late suktas in the early rigveda and the older uh, oldenburg's uh, classification of some suktas as late so we have gone uh, gone into that many details i'm just showing the slides and to the extent in which we have focused on the analysis so that uh, it's it's not like a very shallow kind of analysis that uh, we are focusing at this is the first mandala itself with uh, the divisions um, within the mandala itself there are chronological divisions of course uh, these are all uh, like primarily based on uh, talagiri's uh, uh, analysis and uh, classification and now here this is where my geographical analysis starts so if you if you see uh, uh, this is the 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 final atlas of the rigvedic river after my analysis of all the 30 plus rivers in the rigveda i mapped it into the map of india and you can see uh, you know, the some of this uh, uh, the geographical location as well as the mandala is mapped here so you can the sixth mandala is uh, you know the geography of the sixth mandala is somewhere in the uh, haryana region where we have the uh, few places mentioned in rigveda like uh, uh, this manusha ilaspada uh, all these places uh, the place name mention is very rare in rigveda but the whichever places mentioned in rigveda all of them fall in the haryana kurukshetra region and uh, the rigvedic name for kurukshetra is the varaprasthavya that is the best place in the world that is a kind of uh, terminology it's a attribute uh, but that is the one of the way in which you can identify this central geography which in the later period was known as kurukshetra so this that is all shown here so you can look at uh, you can refer to the the mandala chronology like 637 4 2 5 and then 8 9 10 here and you can look at it in the map you can see the sixth mandala is very much into the central haryana region and of course extending to the western uttar pradesh with the ganga also part of it so from ganga to saraswati is in the sixth mandala region and then in the third mandala you are progressing into vipas sududri confluence of vipas with the three and then as we progress into the seventh mandala you have uh, parishni and asikni that is the ravi and chenab rivers etc so like that it goes so basically what it does is uh, okay this is the uh, kind of larger a uh, snapshot of the varaprasthavya region with uh, some of the oldest rivers mentioned in the rigveda in the 6th mandala or 7th or 3rd mandala all part of this uh, geography in the haryana region extending of course uh, with the uh, ganga as uh, one of the easternmost river 
so uh, like this also another uh, slide where i shows see this is uh, all the migrations uh, consolidated into a single map and the, the greatest migration you can see the westward migration and there are maybe some local migrations in different direction but doesn't count because the greatest uh, or the largest migration is to the westward so this is all uh, you can get directly if you compare the river data in the rigveda and plot it into a geographical map so uh, now what i was mentioning is uh, like if you uh, correlate the the rivers mentioned in each of the mandalas and if you follow the chronological sequence of uh, sikan telegraphy uh, what you can observe is that uh, like a, a simple uh, tally like if you a single tally of the rigvedic rivers that itself shows the westward migration there is nothing else to be done you have to take the river name uh, the uh, the first time the river is mentioned in rigveda and just array it in in terms of the chronological sequence and you will automatically get the same result of a westward migration it is something like a uh, putting some numbers in a formula and you get the result so uh, this is the mere there is a simple tabulation that automatically gives you uh, the westward migration scenario so you can see the uh, river names mentioned here and where it is located so six mandala rivers are in haryana region and then as we go to the 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 subsequent mandalas like the third mandala you get up in the punjab region like the confluence of vipar sudutri a very famous uh, crossing river crossing of ishwamitra is mentioned there and then you go to seventh mandala you reach the next westward rivers that is uh, asikni chenab uh, and then uh, like that so uh, when you are uh, sequencing the this uh, uh, plotting these uh, rivers uh, in a in a geography map of india uh, the oldest rivers uh, which is mentioned in the oldest mandal of rigveda they fall in the eastern regions of eastern easternmost region like ganga uh, like uh, ganga or uh, yamuna or uh, rishadvadi or saraswati uh, like that but so as you go progress in the subsequent uh, mandalas you get rivers in punjab like vipasu the three or even uh, in the subsequent mandalas you get rivers uh, which are farther westward in the in the uh, like uh, uh, parishni uh, uh, the ravi river that is in the punjab pakistan side of the punjab so those rivers you get and finally uh, you get the river, rivers like kuba that is kabul river which is actually a river flowing into afghanistan so that shows that the subsequently the the, the vedic people and those people who are opposed to the vedic people who just uh, moving uh, step by step into the afghanistan that we will be able to see so this is all like uh, the central topic of the the book uh, that is the uh, rivers of rigveda like that so uh, i am just uh, now mentioning the, the most important part uh, this is a summary slide of uh, whatever analysis this is a complete validation of the talgrees oit and uh, uh, that is uh, and you can see the oldest region mentioned in rigveda that is varaprasthavya uh, that is later renamed by a king called puru as kurukshetra that is located uh, between the rivers saraswati and rishadvadi and it southern part is mentioned uh, uh, in the in the itihasas like mahabharata and ramayana mentioned the southern part of the uh, region as kuru jangala both Ram ramayana and mahabharata and both are inside a larger region called yamuna saraswati region and it is bounded by yamuna in the east and saraswati in the west that is the basically now we call haryana uh, that that same region and the, the same result of the westward migration that is uh, traceable from saraswati uh, through vipar to the three confluence parishni asikni vitasta sindhu and kuba river that is kabul river uh, and this is obtained through a kind of a geographical independent geographical analysis so if it is not like anybody who have the same rigvedic data whether they are uh, like in uh, like uh, in india or in the west they will all get the same result of course uh, the why they are not getting is because either because they are following a different a uh, wrong uh, like uh, chronology of the mandalas or there are certain biases uh, or they are not able to see the data clearly uh, that is the uh, only reason otherwise it is an automatic consequence of uh, plotting the rivers you get the westward migration clearly and um, uh, this uh, same chronological tabulation of the uh, rigvedic rivers 
also like uh, give, gives a progressive northward migration and that is also i have noted in my book it's not just the northwestward migration even the northernmost rivers are mentioned in the later youngest mandalas of rigveda so there are certain rivers uh, which is which are mentioned in kashmir region so they are all available like uh, they the, the first mention of these uh, northward uh, rivers are tributaries of sindhu which is uh, flowing to the north of kashmir valley they are also in the on the youngest mandalas like 10th mandala so both the northwestward migration and the, uh, the uh, west uh, northward migration uh, uh, is proved or uh, validated using a mere tabulation of the river data in the uh, like uh, uh, this uh, rigveda from uh, and if it is uh, sequenced based on the 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 relative chronology defined by srikant kalagiri so that is the biggest important point i, I was able to nearly independent validation of it actually because i have started with an open mind and came to the same conclusion and uh, of course there are certain uh, minor differences but none of these differences are impacting the westward migration scenario the location of sarayu i have uh, identified a different location for sarayu based on my geography analysis and uh, the chronological position of uh, some of the kings like prasadas you there are very minor differences and the then the last point the 10th mandala ending point so i put it 1900 bc uh, but in kalagiri's uh, book it will be like 1400 bc uh, so a difference of uh, 400 years so that is none of these three points have any impact on the westward migration so that is an important point i want to put forward and uh, next is uh, like how i brought the chronal uh, this uh, entire scholarship of uh, rigveda by a combined analysis of um, valmiki ramayana and mahabharata because i have familiarity with uh, these three texts i have handled uh, mahabharata for a long period of time uh, by uh, being in touch with it for more than 25 to 30 years and ramayana i have uh, of course as a child everybody reads ramayana but average versions uh, everything you read but uh, i have started a focus study on ramayana uh, from around 2011 and uh, from rigveda around 2006 and mahabharata i don't remember i think from a very childhood days onwards so because of this uh, uh, knowledge uh, or awareness of all the three texts together and also familiar with the data where where the data lies in terms of geography uh, or chronology i was able to do some kind of cross comparative analysis uh, between rigveda and uh, uh, the mahabharata and ramayana so some of the some of them are like local migrations of the kurus and the panchalas uh, i this is important because see exactly like i i was able to uh, go through the rigveda and i got a westward migration uh, in the uh, uh, the major dominant westward migration of people from uh, uh, the central regions like haryana and northwest of uh, uttar pradesh to uh, afghanistan and central asia anybody who is doing an independent analysis of uh, Uh, mahabharata or ramayana they will automatically find some local migrations which are moving from uh, like a west to east so they this is very important that we should clarify like you know why those those kind of local migrations how it fits with the the general trend of a westward migration otherwise this will be used by the aryan invasion theorists to say that look there is people moving from west to east now that proves the iit so that is the reason why i put very important and especially bringing the, this into this conference that those uh, local migration have no bearing on to the, uh, the the overall uh, like uh, uh, this uh, east to west migration that is part of the out of india theory so, so some of the local migrations uh, that you will see is uh, for example the the like lok minor local migration of the sub branches of the bharatas and anus uh, from sindhu that is all this migration originated from the sindhu river nothing more western than that so some people uh, because uh, there is a kind of uh, uh, territorial expansion of sudas that is uh, uh, the most dominant king of the early rigvedic period because of the some people who were living in the same territory of uh, uh, saraswati remana region uh, like uh, for example anavas represented by the abhyavartin chayamana who was that uh, who was allied to you know one of the uh, ancestor of uh, sudas like uh, srinjaya so they srinjaya and abhivartin chamana were all they were all fa- fighting battle together in the yamuna region 
but subsequently in the sudha's period uh, because of the territorial expansion interest uh, abhyavarta in chaimana so descended like kavi chaimana they were all shifted or pushed to the west way to the boundary the the western boundary of sudha's territory that is parushni river so similarly some of the cousins of uh, uh, like uh, so uh, like so that there is another bharada branch so they were also pushed to the the west uh, no so there there you can see a kind of a in a reference in the uh, dasharajna battle about a puru king who is uh, opposed to sudhas so this is again if you are not properly aligning it with uh, the overall scenario this can also cause confusion and uh, you know you can bring about uh, you know the it theory etc so they they may be able to uh, look at this data and they may have an you know, opposite or a confusing kind of a, uh, analysis of that so because of that uh, i have looked at the both mahabharata and uh, uh, rigvedic data and concluded it is a just a local migration so this uh, displaced people that is a sub branch of the bharatas they went up to sindhu river not more than that and they returned back so that is uh, well kind of a local migration it's something like a stone thrown and then the stone comes back so, uh, like that so um, you you can see uh, this uh, yes. sub branch of the bharatas represented in the rigveda as a puru puru of a scornful scornful speech because he is opposed to sudhas and uh, the in the bat, uh, they he he fought with the uh, trishtu bharata king sudhas and then uh, anu king uh, kavi chayamana in the battle uh, the shrajna battle and both were defeated by sudhas and they fled westward to sindhu and same you can see the glimpse of it in mahabharata where samvarana uh, the son of riksha and uh, a paurava uh, he is also mentioned as a paurava that is uh, the term used uh, in mahabharata is paurava because they are all paurava the um, part of the puru lineage even though they have a sub branch they belong to the sub branch of bharatas like that so this uh, uh, krishna bharatas of rigveda represented in uh, ramayana mahabharata as a panchala so the sudas the The, the the enemy king sudha so his uh, clan name is trutsu trutsu like it's another branch of the bharatas and in the mahabharata the panchalas they consider sudhas and his descendants like sahadeva somaka they are their his their ancestors so they are both that are matches so uh, sudha is an ancestral king of the panchalas and panchalas are the descendants of the sudhas so in the mahabharata uh, who uh, it is the, the same information is mentioned as the panchalas uh, defeating samvarana and pushing him to the sindhu river so these are all matching together and uh, defeated by the panchalas the samvarana fled westward from his homeland to live on the banks of sindhu close to where the descendants from the, the, the where sindhu descends from the mountain so uh, i i will show it in the next slide uh, it is uh, is also place where the uh, rigvedic sarayu river joins the sindhu river so uh, these are all matching matching up and then uh, after uh, because they, these people are living together in a territory uh, where you have uh, the western ikshvakus or the, the trikshi branch the, the western ikshvakus are mentioned in rigveda trikshi branch and uh, the trikshi branch is uh, they were living in the western sarayu river which is to be it is a mirror image of the eastern sarayu that is the, where rama was uh, no, the yeah, city of ayodhya of rama was there so in that region you have the western ikshvakus that is uh, mentioned as trikshis and then these bharatas uh, who have fled from sudhas got asylum in there and then an alliance form formed that is an ikshvaku uh, bharata alliance or a trikshi uh, bharata alliance has formed and as a result of that uh, the kuru clan that is uh, it's a blended ancestry of ikshvakus and uh, bharatas forming a kuru clan and this kuru returned back to kurukshetra i mean of course in the name they returned back to vara prathivya that is the, the homeland of uh, their ancestor and he renamed uh, the entire vara prathya region as kurukshetra and the region to the south of trishadvadi as kuru jangala so these two names kurukshetra and kuru jangala both emerged from king kuru so that is this is a very important point which i take into the analysis of ramayana because in uh, ramayana you see uh, the Uh, this uh, the place names like kuru jangala mentioned as contemporary to sri rama and this gives an upper limit for the date of sri rama as lower than king kuru because king kuru 
is the person who gives the name Kurukshetra and Kurujangala. And if Kurukshetra and Kurujangala, any of these names are mentioned as contemporary to Sri Rama, automatically the dating of Sri Rama has to be below or lower than the King Kuru. That is the thing. And another important thing is uh, the this uh, Trishu Panchalas. In the Ramayana also Panchala is mentioned, but they are not mentioned to the east of Kuru. They are mentioned in the Kurujangala region. So that is another data point and uh, there are consequences or there are inferent uh, significance that for the same in the Rig Veda. Uh, and uh, because which indicates that the Tritsu Bharadas in Kuruch, the, the, the Varaprathivya region uh, because of the enemy attack etc shifted from Varaprathivya southwards into Kurujangala. And uh, in the correspondingly in the first mandala of the Rig Veda you will see some names which are not mentioned in any other uh, part of the Rigveda, like Shifa River, which is the Sahibi River in uh, uh, Delhi, Delhi region, and then uh, you see some other different names for the Drishadvadi and Yavyavadi, uh, that is Anjasi and Kulusi, and uh, Saraswati is also rendered in a, with a different name called Virapatni. So these three river names uh, and uh, Sahibi River, that is the Shifa River, mentioned in this region. So that indicate that this uh, this people that Tritsus have shifted from their their original territory to the north of uh, Rishadvadi to the south of Rishadvadi. Not a big change, but a significant change itself. And uh, here actually I have uh, these are the maps which I show the the correspondence between the the Puru in Rigveda as well as in the Mahabharata. So in the Rigvedic uh, verse uh, number seven, eighteen, thirteen mentioned the Puru. And Mahabharata verse number 189-39 mentioned Paurava and that is most important and the Paurava is another is mentioned as a synonym of Samvarana. So that is how these two uh, data points are connected and uh, here you can see Hippapuru participating in the Dachrajana battle and this is the, the migration of the, the Purus uh, expelled by the Sudas and then they are returned back to Kurukshetra. Uh, as a Kuru and the renaming of Kurukshetra as uh, I mean renaming of the Varaprathivya as a Kurukshetra Kuru like that. So those, uh, this is cross correlation very closely match between the Mahabharata and the Rig Veda. And uh, subsequently like after the Kuru returns, uh, that is he came back and reached the Varaprathivya and renamed it as Kurukshetra and Kurujangala. And then you can see the in the late Rigvedic period, there was a uh, migration of the Panchalas and the Kurus. Like so, the the, Pan, the Kurus are moving to Aranavati and then Hastinapura, and the Panchalas uh, they are moving from this uh, Haryana Delhi region to their uh, region in the east of the Kuru, which is the situation in Mahabharata period. So, in the Rama era period, that is during the period of Sri Rama, the Panchalas are situated in the Delhi and uh, uh, Haryana region to the south of the Drishadvati river. But in the Pandava era, when the Pandavas were living, they, they were into the east of the Kuru. So there is that migration we can see between uh, Ma Ramana and Mahabharata period. And this is also have a significance in Mahabharata. You know, uh, why the Pandavas were asked to go to Indra Prastha of all places uh, after marrying Panch Panchali. That, so this is a kind of inference because the Panchalas uh, were the original rulers of Delhi and Indraprastha. And so once the Pandavas married Pan Panchali, Dhritarashtra said, oh, you go and leave there. Uh, that is the best place for you. But that time, at that time, this entire region was forest. So uh, that's why he, uh, we, he was pushed, to, the Pandavas were pushed there. And of course, this is a, also not very relevant la local migration of the Anus. So there is some indication that in a, in the interim period of uh, uh, earlier late Rigvedic, some Anavas have occupied the uh, the Kurukshetra region because the Kurukshetra is mentioned as four cornered, uh, like uh, uh, it is uh, its its main significance is a rectangular region four cornered, and in among the different places the the in the Vendida uh, where the Anavas are mentioned as uh, living. Uh, wherein our the four cornered region is mentioned. So there is a kind of uh, synchrony there that at some point of time the Kurukshetra was occupied by the Anavas. And definitely in the Puranas, the Anavas are portrayed as the Asuras, the Daityas, etc. So we have all these kind of uh, stories about uh, Daityas, Anavas, Daityas conquering the Swarga. So because Varaprathavi is another 
me is exactly the best place in the world it's also the swarga or the heaven so once the the enemies occupied the territory it is uh, basically uh, the puranic uh, in the puranic uh, rendering it will become like asuras congar the devaloka something like that and then the last is the local migration of the eastern ikshvakas again it's a minor uh, migration where the 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 different generations of the ramas ancestors starting with sagara is start, seen as moving from the uh, saraswati region east eastwards into the current location the, the ramas location of ayodhya in the eastern sarayu in the uttar the uttar pradesh that is the tributary of uh, ganga so you can see uh, the sagara and asamanja the son of sagara they are all mentioned as uh, like uh, living in the vicinity of a sarayu but that sarayu uh, is not yet mentioned or indicated as the tributary of ganga so that means it should be a different sarayu than the sarayu in the uttar pradesh so that in the full detail i have mentioned in my book itself because the asamanja is mentioned as throwing a um, their his uh, that is the children of a citizen into the sarayu river but then at that time uh, only in the like in the if you put, put the puranic narrative asamanja's uh, second level third level ancestor i mean descendant bhagiratha i already is mentioned as uh, actually connected with ganga so bhagiratha is considered as discovered you no know, he discovered ganga and that is that uh, entire uh, geographical concept is captured in the uh, this uh, in the itihasic uh, poetic narrative as bhagiratha bringing ganga so the the this particular eastern ikshvaka connection with ganga start only with bhagiratha so there is no possibility that uh, the ancestors of akiratha like uh, sagara samanjas have any kind of connection connection with any tributary of ganga that is uh, the sarayu river of uttar pradesh so this sarayu is different and i have identified it as the saraswati itself uh, because these two uh, names sarayu and saraswati uh, they are all uh, can you some kind of a synonymity is there in that that river names and other even otherwise uh, the sagara is mentioned as in a kind of a arid territory so uh, one possible reason for the migration is uh, the aridity in the saraswati river and this is the same reason why there are many migrations uh, from saraswati to of of a different other uh, like uh, clans uh, not just uh, the ikshvakas but also the bharatas so they have shifting to the ganga as a as a better Uh, but, but if uh, one good river is uh, you know uh, dried up then they will search for a, another better river and that that is the ganga that is that is uh, they have decided so in between also you have data points like the river uh, that is uh, the, the son of asamanja that is grandson of sagara is mentioned amshumat and the river the yamuna is also mentioned as amshumati river so that river names also match match with uh, the the generation that is the older generation of sridama and uh, subsequently it is also mentioned uh, just like bhagiratha tried to bring ganga his father diliba also tried to bring bring ganga but he was not successful but only in the second generation that is bhagiratha was able to bring ganga so that is it shows that there are two generation attempt to establish uh, themselves in ganga river and so the bhagiratha was successful but diliba was not successful and he died unsuccessful this is mentioned in the ramayana and same reflection you can see in the uh, mahabharata where not many people know uh, ganga was proposed to pradipa the father of uh, shantanu but somehow that marriage didn't take place but only shantanu was able to marry ganga and of course here also just like in the bhagiratha story uh, in the marriage is basically the establishment of uh, shantanu in ganga river whereas uh, his father pradipa tried but could not so there are both in the ikshvaku lineage as well as in the guru lineage there was two generation attempt for shifting the, themselves to the ganga river uh, that we can very clearly see and uh, here you can also see a, some kind of a mirror image kind of situation in the geography because gomati and sarayu are tributaries of ganga and exactly there is gomati and sarayu uh, which, uh, which are tributaries of uh, the sindhu river so there is a migration there is a kind of a mirror image migration that has uh, happened uh, like see if you look at the ikshvakus uh, because they they the they, they all you know that they are all descended from manu that is that there is a meaning that the ikshvaku is a son of manu means so the manu is the kind of a central uh, 
people who migrate from the southern sea to along the Saraswati and Sindhu river to the northward. And while they were living here, one branch of the Ikshwakos, that is Trikshi, uh, migrated to the west and they were living in the western Sarayu and another branch. As a mirror image, they migrated into the east. So you can see uh, the tributary of Sindhu in the west, Gomati and Sarayu, you can see here. Uh, Gomati and Sarayu here. And similarly, you have a Gomati and Sarayu tributary of Ganga. So this western uh, Sarayu and Gomati and the eastern Sarayu and Gomati, they are like mirror image with uh, the central axis being Saraswati. So that is how they are the uh, these uh, migrations are distributed. And uh, that you can see. And uh, then here, this is a little more detail about the uh, migration of uh, this, uh, uh, like saga, the Eastern Ishaku lineage. So you can see the river name matches with the generation name, like uh, Amshuman, Amshuman with Amshumati, like that. And it most goes uh, and finally reaches the Ayodhya city that is the, on the banks of the Eastern Sarayu. And exactly like this, this is also solved the riddle in the archaeology where Ayodhya, dating of Ayodhya is not very ancient. Uh, like, uh, like for example in Dirana or in the Saraswati, Drashaduti region you get uh, Rakhigari Rak which is 6000 BC and um, Birana at 8000-7000 BC. But similarly the Ayodhya which is uh, very, very just one single verse mentioned as a city founded by Manu. But it is uh, currently the archaeology dating it is 1750 BC. So there is no um, ancientness to the, uh, the region of Ayodhya. And this is the reason because Ayodhya is a very young city uh, which is uh, founded somewhere by Rekhu, uh, the, uh, the one of the uh, nearest ancestor of uh, uh, Rama, Rekhu or Aja. So that is why you can you can see the archaeology, the uh, it is uh, uh, very less. And as you go uh, farther, uh, farther from uh, uh, like uh, Saraswati to the east or west, the Chronologically, the date uh, date of the the archaeological site drops. So I have uh, side I have slide on that. Uh, but then uh, these are the kind of uh, impacts uh, on the chronology of Valmiki uh, Ramayana uh, and Mahabharata. So one is Rama and Shantanu, both mentioned as contemporaries in tenth mandala, and so they are both Rigvedic kings, contemporary to tenth mandala of Rigveda, that is two thousand to nine hundred BC. And this place names like Kurujangala, Panchala, Hastinabura as mentioned as contemporary to Rama and Valpniki Ramayana, uh, which gives uh, kind of an upper limit for uh, Rama. And even the King Kuru is not mentioned in Rigveda, but the word Kuru is uh, mentioned in Rigveda as a, as a verb. And it is a late Rigvedic noun actually. And in the early Rigvedic, the, the, it is all mentioned as Kronu. So uh, even though the King Kuru is not attested in the Rigveda, the word Kuru is a later Rigvedic term. So that itself shows uh, the, the terms like Kuru Jangala and Kuru Shetra should be later Rigvedic. And subsequently, since they are contemporary to Sri Rama, the Rama has to be dated later to uh, this uh, Kuru. And uh, I have in my book, I have uh, found a uh, kind of relative date for Kuru at 2000 BC. And it matches with the dating of Rama at 1920 BC as later to King Kuru. Because uh, the tenth model of Rigveda can span from 2000 to 900 BC. And Hastinapura, uh, again, uh, the, uh, along with Kurjangla and pa Panchala, Hastinapura is mentioned. So here actually I have looked at the Mahabharata data. There is a eponymous king called Hastin, introduced as a founder of Hastinapura, but he is not uh, referred in as you know, the alternate uh, lineage. So it's just a spurious data. And so I connect the, the Hastinapura with King Shantanu. Uh, which is uh, like uh, 1920, uh, like, uh, so King, if King Shantanu is uh, founding Hastinapura, corresponding to the uh, the Aitihasic poetic narrative that Shantanu married Ganga, so it can be considered as uh, Shantanu founding Hastinapura in city of Ganga as a, uh, as a new city. Then uh, my uh, analysis can be validated by the dating of Hastinapura and currently whatever archaeology is showing it is uh, dated to what, around 1900 BC. Uh, or uh, slightly uh, slightly like within 100 uh, years here and there. So that is, there is a kind of matching up there. And I have also another uh, theory mentioned in the Rigveda, uh, reverse of Rigveda where 
the possibility of other clans other than the kurus being active in that region uh, in the on the banks of ganga which is mentioned in the early rigvedic like brabu and others who has got a uh, kind of a, a ferry in that uh, on the on the banks of ganga for trading so there there will be ancient uh, territories uh, established on ganga which are older than shantanu but not belonging to the kuru lineage the, for example vishwamitra is mentioned as uh, moving to that region uh, and renaming ganga as jannavi whereas jannu is the ancestor of uh, vishwamitra so there was a claim of kushikas which is another third branch of the bharatas on ganga river and uh, when kushikas were uh, living in i mean uh, were established in ganga it was named as jannavi uh, as an ancestor of uh, vishwamitra uh when the ikshvagus dominated ganga the ganga was known as bhagirathi because bagiratha was uh, you know uh, like the the person who established on ganga from the ikshvagus side and when shantanu i mean when the kurus established in ganga then that they gave a different name uh, different methodology saying that uh, shantanu married ganga so you can see three lineages uh, they successively like kushikas ikshvagus and the kurus established on the ganga and that is poetically referenced in the uh, mahabharata like that and in ramayana as well so this these two points dilipa and pradipa uh, dilipa from ikshvagu lineage and, and pradipa from kuru lineage they both tried to bring i mean dilipa tried to bring ganga or pradipa tried, was proposed to marry ganga but only in the second generation they were succeed bagiratha succeeded dilipa in bringing ganga or uh, uh like uh, shantanu was su- successful in uh, marrying so this settlement uh, is very clearly mentioned in this and it indicates attempts of ikshvagus and kurus to establish upon ganga spanning two generations former uh, earlier than the latter both happening during the late rigvedic period but none of this means that other clans were uh, not active in ganga because older than these two things happening the uh, the clans like kushikas were there on every active on ganga and that is why you see ganga in the early rigvedic period the mention of ganga in the early rigvedic period you can see like that and uh, this is that uh, central point where the kuru jangala panjala and hastinapura mentioned in ramayana uh, as part of the travel of bharata i mean messengers trying going to the uh, kekaya janamada to bring back bharata so there these uh, places are mentioned and the uh, location and uh, now how i identified i mean there is a how to date how do i date the 10th mandala of rigveda and of course also uh, dating of sri rama and shantanu so for this i used the like uh, the research work of ashok batnagar who have uh, based on the same astro archaeoastronomy based analysis uh, he has uh, found a very good date of 1793 bc and it's an astronomy date uh, in the same category of uh, those like vedas virarya or uh manish pandit or nilesh of so the same methodology but he gets a result that it is in 1793 bc kurukshetra war has been occurred and he has got a coherence of 95% of the uh, astronomical references in the uh, mahabharata is corroborated and he arrived at the date of 1793 bc but what is special about this date is that dr sanjay manjol that is archaeologist uh, he has independently arrived at a date of 1800 to 1700 bc for kurukshetra war purely based on archaeology so he has studied ocp uh, that or, or color plotry uh, the, in the area of uh, haryana and western uttar pradesh and also the harappan uh, da- data harappan dating in the haryana region and based on these studies including the sinali chariot uh, discovery he has put a date of 1800 to 1700 bc for kurukshetra war it's a range because archaeology normally gives a range rather than exact dates and uh ashok patnagar 1793 uh, bc day purely based on astronomy falls in the same range and so as of as we speak today we have got a very good coherence between archaeology and astronomy on the kurukshetra war date but nobody is speaking about it because people are very much interested in 3000 bc dates etc and somehow we trying to prove that those dates are the correct ones etc but once you have already have a kind of a correlation between astronomy and archaeology we have to call it out and i call it as a dyaus dhara consensus where you have a correlation of archaeology and astronomy and they have both agreed on a same date and it has to be taken very seriously i mean uh, even if there are further research uh, which may have a different date 
today you have to focus and highlight on this state because it has got uh, full support of archaeology and is also uh, having uh, array to astronomy. And once you have this data as a sheet angle, it becomes a sheet angle for dating both the events in Ramayana and Mahabharata and also in the Rig Veda. Uh, because uh, both uh, Sri Rama and uh, Shantanu are mentioned in the 10th Mandala of the Rig Veda. So you can give a date for 10th Mandala. And that date is uh, the 2000 BC to 1900 BC. And Parishit, uh, King Parishit is born one year after the Kurukshetra War. So he is a, uh, uh, in, the, in terms of generation, he is anchor to the Kurukshetra War. And uh, between Shantanu and Parishit, there are five generations. Shantanu, Vijitravirya, Pandu, Arjuna, Abhimanyu and Parishit. And you know that the, they lived at different period like Shantanu, I mean, uh, Abhimanyu lived only for 16, year, 16 or 17 years. Uh, Vijitravirya also died very early. So there is early death in the generation, but some others like uh, Shantanu, uh, then Bhishma Pitama, all these people lived uh, a very long period. So I take an average of 25 years for a generation. And this 24 year generation gap is uh, normal in all the historical dynasties like Gupta dynasty, Maurya dynasty, everywhere. It is a golden average. So if you use that 25 years of the golden average uh, of a generation, you can assume four generations in a century. And that is what uh, even Dr. Elster also mentioned between Rama uh, and uh, Kurishatawa, there are around a century of different uh, difference because Rama and Shantanu are contemporary and to the 10th Mandala. And of course, uh, many of the people have, uh, after seeing my book, uh, Reverse of Rigveda and Geography of Ramana, they ask about uh, now what about the Yuga system, etc. Uh, so I think I need to clarify that uh, because the, the Yuga definitions came very late, like in the Puranic period. Uh, uh, the, uh, to summarize it, in the Mahabharata, it is very clearly mentioned the Pandavas use a Panchavarshiya Yuga. That is, a, uh, one Yuga is only five years of duration. And that is coming very clear uh, in a conversation between Bhishma Pitama and uh, uh, this Duryodhana. Because Duryodhana questioned whether the Pandavas really completed 13 years. And then Bhishma made this calculation. And in that calculation, it is very clear the Pandava with the, the active Yuga during the Pandava era is five, five years. And five such, uh, I mean, four such years, uh, the Chadur Yuga of 20 years. And this 20 year Chadur Yuga, you can, uh, it is got synchronized with the Saturn Jupiter cycle because uh, Saturn and Jupiter conjunct in every 20 years in one of the signs or in nearby one of the star. And uh, there is a much larger Saturn Jupiter conjunction that is 60 years. That is like they both conjunct in the same star or the same sign. For this, you have to wait for 60 years. And so this, uh, once the uh, the 20, 20 year Chatur Yuga got uh, uh, corroborated with the 20 year Saturn Jupiter cycle, naturally it got corroborated with the 60 year cycle. And the 60 year cycle become 120 years, it become 1200 years, then 12,000 years, and the last 12,000 got multiplied by 360, it become 42 lakhs, uh, 43 lakhs, 20,000, that very big uh, Yuga system. So that is a pure mathematical calculation that is used by poets and uh, astronomers, but nothing to do with uh, the real lifetime of Pandavas or uh, with uh, uh, Rama. So uh, again, uh, you can, if you see the starting with the date of birth of Rama, 1920 to, uh, uh, if, you, if you look at, there is a kind of a synchrony with the 120 year Yuga system, because somewhere in between when the Yuga got, uh, you know, like grown from 20 to 60 to 120, you can latch on to the 120 year system. So then, because uh, like uh, you can even prove that Rama was in a 120 year long Treta Yuga uh, to the end of the 120 year long Treta Yuga and then Pandavas were living in a 120 year long Dwavara Yuga. I mean, if you want, I mean, it's basically uh, as uh, if you want to fulfill the Yuga, Yuga system, then you can think, uh, I mean, do that actually. And I have mentioned that is in my book, uh, The Geography of Ramayana that it can still be a possibility that uh, they were classified like that later, not exactly during the lifetime of the Pandavas or Rama, but in a later stage, this uh, this might have gone into the calculation and then Rama was mapped to Treta Yuga and uh, Pandavas to the Dwapara Yuga. And one more surprising thing is that in the towards the Uttarakhanda, the poet confuses himself and say that Rama is living in Dwapara Yuga. You can see it in the Valtmika Ramana, you can see that it is there. So now I uh, focus uh, to the uh, other important points. Two corroborations like Rigveda, Valmigramana and Mahabharata with archaeology. And I will also do it same for with the genetics. 
this slide it shows the like uh, the, i have in the beginning i saw the same slide and if you look at in the bottom i have put the harappan faces early and mature harappan faces and how it very much closely synchronized with the rigvedic chronology and the harappan chronology so you can see the early late and uh, i mean early middle and late rigveda the entire rigveda is completed by early harappan and mature harappan uh, with a very close date matching and the kurukshetra war and its aftermath happening in the late rigvedic period and if you look at the geography it is even close the, this is like the sum total of all the places mentioned in rigveda including the southern ocean uh, which uh, very people doesn't consider and if you consider that it is exactly the harappan geography i mean not many difference between the geography rigvedic geography and harappan geography and uh, here is you can see the growth of uh, between 1900 bc and the uh, kurukshetra war that our date of 1793 bc how the uh, ocp culture is growing so you can see 1900 bc is a snapshot of the rigvedic 10th mandala and 1793 bc you can see the snapshot in the archaeology uh, uh, like the growth uh, the, the growing up to panja beyond panjala to uh, even in kambas kashi and other places you can see it very clearly here so there is 100% or maybe or 90% match match between the growth of archaeological sites with uh, these events uh, so i have to make a con- make a very logical conclusion that both are the same because if your chronology matches your geography matches it's uh, you don't have to multiply the entities and say that both harappan and the uh, vedic of course vedic aidihasik i have to say vedic aidihasik civilization and the harappan civilization are the same uh, that is a kind of uh, inference and uh, yeah i mean there, there are many other considerations like i mentioned the rama date in 1920 bc aligns with the 1750 bc of uh, date, date for ayodhya and it is uh, much more solid and foundation than rama dated to 5114 bc using a uh, excised uh, verse in the critical word, no, the rama jataka which is excised the jataka itself came from the greek uh, i you know it's a greek idea of uh, the personalized jatakas so this is a very late and so many people have dated rama at uh, 5, uh, 6th millennium bc because of this uh, rama jataka but it is a very late uh, in the uh, evolution of ramayana so we cannot do using that but my date of uh, uh, 1920 bc is the closest to the whatever is available for ayodhya in the archaeology and uh, then what yeah again i mentioned very important point is uh, if you go eastwards or westwards from saraswati you see more or less the dro- the dropping of the archaeological site average age so the aryan invasion theories are bringing the short guy in the bmrc uh, bmsc region as a uh, their trump card for the ait Uh, but it is only dated 2000 bc and you can you get uh, uh, varanasi you now kashi also now at 2000 bc so on the both ends you have 2000 bc but in the saraswati you have 8000 6000 6, 4000 bc so this is this bmrc at 2000 bc which the ait theorists are bringing as a new evidence will not stand here, uh, any chance here because it's a mirror image like from saraswati to east and west there are migration so that is very clearly coming in then uh, this a few slides on the geography of ramayana this is a sum total sum total of all the places mentioned in the ramayana it all comes to the north of narmada river and uh, that that is how you can have a very good correlation because see some of the inform- uh, like it's a later traditional information that lanka is in sri lanka or uh, kinda is in hampi uh, or panchavadi is in nasik or patrajal they were evolved as a part of later tradition but actual analysis in the ramayana after tracing the actual motions or after local movements of sri rama has made it is very clear that rama moved northwards after meeting agastya not to southwards and then you can see that it's entirely matching with the uh, harappan civilization which is southern point is in narmada and to the western uh, shore, shores of maharashtra so that uh, it aligns with that uh, uh, whatever is available in archaeology and whatever ramayana says both uh, matching up and uh, here you can see the growth in the rigvedic geography to the aidihasik geography during the period of rama and the last slide because the uh, between the 100 years between rama and the pandavas there was incursion to the south uh, the two places uh, which is the western maharashtra and the eastern orissa are mentioned as a new places uh, discovered uh, especially like uh, it is mentioned that parashurama went there as a new place after uh, handing over everything he conquered to kashyapa so two places uh, one is surparaga another one is uh, the mahendra mountains 
one is in orissa coastal orissa another one is in the coastal maharashtra so these are the two new lands acquired uh, during the 100 years between uh, ramayra and the pandavaira and of course there are references to chola pandi kerala so that is it is undecidable because uh, i am waiting for the uh, evidence of the dating of the chola pandi kerala regions and if it matches with the pandavaira that is 1793 bc we can say that there was some kind of uh, connection otherwise we have to consider it as a later addition that has emerged after the pandavaira most locations confirm to the north of narmada uh, fully aligns with the geography and chronology of the Sindhu Saraswati Narmada civilization. So, there, there is new term we have required because we have been using Harappan civilization as the term, but it has gone beyond Harappa. Now, uh, Narmada also has to be seen as uh, the continuity of the Saraswati Sindhu civilization. So, that terminology also we have, we have used here. And the last slide, uh, yeah, last slide on the genetics, uh, which is very relevant. Uh, so, you might have heard the Neeraj Rai's, Dr. Neeraj Rai's uh, talk. Uh, where he has uh, uh, mentioned about uh, uh, that ancestral North Indian and ancestral South Indian. Uh, those, uh, these two ancestral genetic stock in India is uh, uh, around 3000 BC and beyond. And the actual genetic mix-up happened be, uh, between 2000 BC and the first century CE. And the dates of, uh, you know, whatever dates arrived between uh, for Rigveda 10th Mandala and the uh, Hasik age, that is 200 years, that is 1950 to 1750 BC. First half Ramayra, that is uh, this uh, 1950 to 1850, and second half the Pandavera, 1850 to 1750 BC. This is aligning with this intermixture because uh, it is in the Ramayana and Mahabharata that you actually see the people starting mixing up, right? Rama is going uh, like southwards to the Chitra Kuda, uh, and then Pandava, the Sahadeva is going to southwards. So there is a kind of intermixing uh, that is reflected in the Itihasas very well match with uh, whatever is in the genetics. That is one thing I was uh, mentioning. And of course, uh, the, it is detailed discussed by Neeraj Rai that uh, earlier there was a confusion about uh, you know, the BMRC people came to um, uh, IVC, but it is now very clear uh, IV, from IVC to BMRC, that is the northwest of Kalinsan region, there people have migrated, not the opposite. And even the migration direction is very certain in the genetic. It is from Harappan region to the northwest and not the vice versa. And uh, then the there is another very interesting thing I have noted uh, with a lot of interest that IVC people are found in uh, Central Asia around 2500 BC, uh, which is very much matching with Talagiri's chronology as well as uh, some of the mention I have put in my book uh, from the point of geography, uh, that is uh, you know, the river migration in the northern direction from Kashmir to the northward. Uh, going into Central Asia. So, that matches uh, very well with this 2500 BC discovery of IVC artifacts in Central Asia with the direction very clearly from uh, IVC to Central Asia, not the opposite. So, that is very clinching and uh, there is nothing, uh, I, I, those those people who actually focus on data, there is nothing more, more to say about alien innovation theory because from all angles, uh, it is completely the opposite that we are going to, we are getting to see. And uh, that is what I have to uh, put in, in front of this forum. That my own analysis, uh, where most of it is a very independent analysis uh, from the point of geography and uh, some amount of chronology, with 90% uh, synchronized with the uh, Talagiri's chronology, maybe a 10% different, which is not at all having any impact on the uh, east to west migration scenario. It is also corroborating the, uh, the, the opposite of the Aryan invasion theory, that is, out of India and uh, Indian origin homeland theory. That is, that is my conclusion and thank you. Yeah, the acoustics here is pretty good, so I uh, I hardly felt the need. But okay, so um, Gigi, I'd like to um, go, you to go a little bit deeper into the last point. You know, I, I, I thought, you know, I, I was waiting for it all the time, really. Um, so, uh, you you have written something about uh, Uttara Kuru and Uttara Madra, and um, just so they figure somewhere in the Itihasa. Um, now, what can we know about them that is relevant to the, uh, the homeland uh, debate? Yeah, yeah, and uh, this part uh, is actually very interesting in, in my uh, third book on the uh, Mahabharata geography because 
So the name itself is very clear. Like only when you have a kuru, you have uttara kuru. So uttara kuru is uh, in mentioned in reference to a kuru. Uh, so uh, because of that, uh, when you have an uttara kuru, then it automatically gives you a direction that it is a migration from kuru to northwards and forming an uttara kuru. And uh, both in uh, Ramayana and in Mahabharata, different geographical places are mentioned as Uttara Guru. Uh, of course, um, the sequence doesn't matter here because uh, so the re reference in Ramayana is a, a late tradition. It is part of a late tradition passage where Uttara Guru is mentioned. Uh, like, uh, and if you, you have to correspond it with Siberia, because uh, the Uttara Guru region is play, as mentioned as in Ramayana as a place where. Uh, there is very less sunlight, uh, very very long, very long nights, and very less uh, uh, some uh, uh, like days, and very long winters, and very less summer. So it's all matches up with the uh, Siberian region. Of course, uh, I'm also telling that because other regions, uh, southern to this already mentioned that that is why you have to identify Siberia. And uh, in case of uh, Mahabharata, there are three Uttara gurus mentioned. One is straightforward to the north of uh, Kuru region. That is Kuru means the Haryana uh, and Western Uttar Pradesh region. To the north of it means Uttarakhand. So Uttarakhand is mentioned as Uttara Guru, which seems to be an older version of the Uttara Guru, because in the Uttara Guru reference in Mahabharata is in the uh, like uh, older parts of the Mahabharata. So that has to be considered as older. And then you have uh, subsequently in the later parts of the Mahabharata, Uttara Guru is mentioned as the Kailas Manasarova region. So you can see Uttara Guru is uh, between Ramayana and Mahabharata. If you properly chronologically lay out the the mention the 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 passages of the mention there is a very straightforward uh, south to north migration there and same with uttara madra uh, the the madra it has to be in reference to the madra and madra is uh, very clearly the cl code sakala region and with reference to Ma uttara uh, madra uttara madra in mahabharata is identified with somewhere to the north of kashmir uh, what we now currently call the Swat and the uh, Gilgit Baltistan area is uh, that is the area where you uh, actually normally get Uttara Madra. But of course, in the subsequent literature, I see Uttara Madra, and uh, you can see older than Mahabharata, where Uttara Madra is mentioned as in the Kyrgyzstan, that Central Asian region as well. So, here also you can see there is a uh, south to north migration that is happening. I mean, it's uh, aligns with the Central Asian. Uh, the, Indian genetic pool going to the Central Asia. And uh, one more point I have mentioned, there is a kind of, even Neeraj Rai mentioned about uh, uh, some, something like uh, the steppe ancestry is started seeing in India from uh, very late, like uh, from 1600 or 1500 BC. If I, if I listen to him correctly, he mentioned that. But then there is a correspondence like Cambojas uh, and the, uh, the Shakas are mentioned. So, not necessarily the historical Shakas or Kambajas, but there, after the Kurukshetra war, there is a mention about an invasion, which many people are not aware about. In Mahabharata, mentioned about an invasion that it is mentioned as a futuristic prediction words between Markandai and Yudhishthira that some uh, foreign tribes started coming into uh, and okay, started occupying the uh, Haryana and Uttar Pradesh region. That is their own territory, the Kuru territory. Mm -hmm. So, you can connect it with the uh, Probably you can make a connection with that. Like in the later stage, the steppe uh, came into the uh, region. Very good. So that means that uh, the uh, Central Asian uh, influx that um, David Wright claims to have discovered that's that's actually in the Mahabharata. Post mentioned. Yeah. yeah. Yes. yes. Okay, uh, so thank you very much. Let me just uh, briefly introduce myself. Uh, my name is Brishti Guha. I am an economist at JNU. I teach there. So just, uh, you know, I enjoyed your talk. Uh, one logical point uh, which I want to talk about is about Kuru and Ram. So you mentioned that in the Ramayan there are uh, mentions of Kuru Jangal. And then you said that therefore Ram must have been after Kuru, but it actually doesn't prove that. It just proves that Ramayan was composed after Kuru and Ramayan could have been composed uh, long after Ram. And we know in fact, you know, parts of the epics, different parts were composed at different times. So I just wanted to make that uh, logical ah, point. Correct. correct. So uh, that this particular point I have... Uh, uh, explained explained in my uh, book uh, the geography of Ramayana. One important point is that just like the Rigveda, Rigveda has got chronological layers, 
Ramayana is also having chronological layers. And this reference of uh, three places, Hastinapura, Kurujangala, and Panchala, is in the oldest layer of the Ramayana, that is Ayodhya Kanda. And Ayodhya Kanda is uh, considered as the oldest layer because it has got the oldest, uh, largest overlap with the Rigvedic geography. Because KK, Janapada, everything falls squarely into the Rigvedic heartland. Uh, that is uh, in the uh, like uh, in the in the whatever we call the Sindhu region. So uh, because of this, like it, since the information is in the oldest layers of uh, Valmiki Ramayana, and we know very clearly the later edition, later version, later layers in the Valmiki Valmi Ramayana like Uttarakhanda etc. and the, some parts of Balakanda. But this uh, references are in the oldest core in the Valmiki Ramayana. The second point is uh, like. The data in the Rigveda regarding Rama, that is Rama, the mighty king, in the 10th mandala of the Rigveda, automatically <coughs> gives a kind of a lift to uh, that is uh, Rama's uh, actual dating, and it has it now got automatically connected with the Rigvedic uh, chronology. And but course, even uh, 10th mandala hymns were over a period of time, right? They were not all at the same time. There were many redacted hymns uh, in the Rig Veda. Um, so, see, even Michael Witzel agrees about uh, that uh, uh, there are no, like, when you say, uh, see, of course, uh, there is a chronological growth happened in the uh, Rig Veda from the uh, 6th mandala to 10th mandala. That is, anyway, very clearly uh, charted out by Sri Kant Kalagiri. Uh, but the date should uh, date squarely fall in that chronological uh, um, bracket of 3300 BC to uh, 1400 BC according to Thalagiri or 3300 BC to 1900 BC according to myself. And there are no some, some similar to what you know, whatever in I mean Mahabharata or Ramana, there are no uh, additions after a huge amount of time. In case of uh, Mahabharata or Ramana, you can see some of the passages are after a very huge gap. Like some something happened during the uh, some addition happened during this uh, uh, Sunga period, etc. But none of none of such additions can be seen in the uh, Rig Veda. Uh, the only we can say slightly later addition, but even that is also cannot be gone beyond contemporaries of Veda Vyasa, is the Anukramani of the Rig Veda. So tenth mandala is uh, older than the Rig Vedic Anukramani itself. So we cannot use that argument that uh, the tenth mandala of Rig Veda have a very late additions of okay. course it is oldest it is the latest in the Vedic uh, chronology but it is uh, not having big gap uh, and uh, after, after a long period of for example hundreds or thousands of years no data is added into Rig Veda. Uh, just a very short question yeah. uh, does the uh, aging well you said um, Ganga was uh, 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 reclaimed from Trivish trip around uh, um, but two generations before Bhargava, they, they tried it, uh, and later uh, it was uh, Bhagirath who just brought it down. Mm. Now, does this tally with the geological evidence? That's what. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so there are three clans who whose claim to Ganga is very very clearly recorded in the three texts: Rigveda, Ramayana, and Mahabharata. One is Kushikas. Who did it very earlier, like uh, earlier in the early Rigvedic period, and then the Ikshwagos, uh, somewhere in the early part of the late Rigvedic period, and finally the Shantanu, uh, that is the Kurus, in the late Rigvedic period. So, three clans uh, did this movement from Saraswati to Ganga. And uh, if you look at in the archaeological uh, records, you can similarly see that uh, the Saraswati Yamuna region is older. Uh, on an average archaeology in the Saraswati Ramana region is older than anything uh, which is uh, between Yamuna and Ganga. And all the archaeological sites between Ganga and some eastern uh, rivers like Gandaki or uh, Sadanira or Kaushaki is still younger. So there is a gradient from Saraswati to Ganga to the easternmost uh, rivers uh, like Gandaki, Gandaki and uh, Kaushaki. You see a very steep gradient. One is in, 6, uh, in Saraswati is in 6000, 8000, 4000 BC and to the east in the Bihar, the Kaushagi and all these 1000 BC, 1200 BC. I think some sites now coming at 1500 BC but Bronze Age sites mostly fall into 1200, 1000 BC. Yes, in order for you to follow a bit uh, the way that the uh, homeland debate is going, um, I merely want to put on record that at long last, among serious 
uh, out of India scholars, we finally have a debate going on internally. I don't mean this Twitter shouting of all these totally uninformed people. No, I mean a debate between Jijit and Shrikant Alagiri. You see, this is one thing where they disagree. Shrikant says that there was a very important population already in more easterly parts of India. Uh, so that's an interesting debate, but we will not uh, carry it out now. Now, you lady, and then uh, after that, Ramakrishna, and I think we'll have to leave it at that. Yes. Thank you. Uh, did you fantastic talk. Um, very, very fascinating. Just one point I wanted to ask you about, since you have mentioned that from what you have inferred, the Lanka that has been talked about is actually not the Lanka that we think. Now, yeah. This is a little contentious. If it takes too long to explain here, then it's okay. But if you could just throw some uh, light on what that uh, is. It, was, it was really painful for me as well. Uh, to uh, like Because uh, if you look at my uh, older uh, writings in my book, in, uh, website Ancient Voice from 2011 onwards, uh, I have placed Lanka in wherever tradition plays in the Sri Lanka and everything. But when you uh, go through the exact step-by-step -step, uh, Rama's motion in, mentioned in the uh, Ayodhya Kanda and the Aranya Kanda, very clearly uh, it is mentioned the southernmost Rama wind is the Agastyasrama uh, and it is located somewhere to the north of the uh, Vindhya ranges because uh, that is where like uh, after that the uh, Agastya sages uh, crossed the Vindhya and went to the south. So during the Rama's period, Agastya was in the northern uh, side of the Vindhya ranges. So Rama reached up to there. And Agastya is very clearly mentioned. Uh, I mean, when Rama asked, "Where can I? Where can I have uh, made and make an ashram of my, myself?" Then he said, "Go to north." Okay, very clearly direction mentioned. Go north. So he, whatever he went southward after meeting Agastya, he went again went northward. And um, that means there is a position for uh, Panchavadi, which is uh, locatable in the Satna district of Madhya Pradesh, very close to Chitrakoda also. And in Ramayana, there are so many references where you give, you have verses which say, you know, make a kind of sense that Chitragoda, Malivat Mountain, Panchavati are all very close by. That is very clearly said. Finally, lastly, the um, Lenka is mentioned as a uh, place in Southern Ocean. And uh, as far as Rigveda is concerned, Southern Ocean is the Gujarat, uh, the ocean around Gujarat, Maharashtra region. And that is was designated as a Southern Ocean for a long period of time. Till the time people started going, migrate, exploring the peninsula of India. And again, uh, why Narmada? Because all the ancestors of Rama is, I mean, Ravana, that is the Malya, Malivat, uh, Mali, Sumali, everybody uh, mentioned as marrying uh, daughters of Narmada. So it is something similar to Santanu marrying Ganga. The Rakshasas, uh, the ancestors marry Narmada's uh, daughters, which is again a clear indication that they settled in the Narmada River Valley. So on the banks of Narmada, in southern ocean so that is lanka is and the very close to the bragu uh, bragu kaksha and bragu was a kind of a priest for uh, indrajit who is uh, uh, the son of ravana so uh, bragu is mentioned as uh, bhargava is uh, the shukra is mentioned as a priest of uh, the indrajit so bhargava has a presen presence in the uh, lanka region i have a i am sc saxena former chief commissioner of income tax all right I have a fundamental question regarding this interpretation. Vedas are to be interpreted according to the principles of Parini's Ashtadhyayi and also Mahabhashya as, as interpreted by Patanjali. Now, if I do not know which one, whether you have, uh, because the reason is that the meaning of every mantra is to be interpreted contextually, that is uh, not uh, by the system of Rudi, which is uh, uh, literal, but it is to be done in a contextual manner, and that is yogic. Now, if that is so, probably you have entirely relied upon Sayana and others following Sayana. And and uh, Sayan was a, a, a divan of the Vijayanagar Empire and the younger brother of Vidyarana. Now, if that is so, then you have, because of a, a compulsion to see history, uh, 
into the Veda, you have tried to say history, but which task should have been done on the basis of Brahmanas? Because that is the Itihasa, that is Aitreya Brahmana by, uh, by the son of Itaradasi. That is why it is known as Aitreya and Shatpat Brahmana of Yajjavalke and, and others. Because they are known as Itihasa, Itihasa, Narashansi, etc. So, my, uh, I wouldn't say contention, my submission, you can say, is whether th that was a proper way to have relied upon Sayana or Mahidar or others, because following them, the, the European scholars entirely depended upon them. And the, the only one who went back to the old system was Swami Dayananda Sursati following Swami Virjanand Dandi. Then that has been ignored entirely. Even its English translation is available. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I can make it very short answer. So uh, the the main purpose of the Rig Veda is the recitation, and uh, its uh, its actual purpose is uh, the the poetic praise of the devatas and uh, its usage in the like rituals. So that's that without this particular data analysis in the Rig Veda is not having any impact or bearing on the actual focus of uh, Rig Veda or Mahabharata or Ramayana. It is something like uh, you know, even if Carl Sagan has written a science fiction movie, uh, like uh, novel today, you can look at it and find out some historical imprints in, in, inside that. Even any literature work will have some imprints of the, the time and place where it is created. And we are only focusing on that uh, uh, like, uh, chronological and geographical imprints inside the uh, this uh, text. And it is automatically available uh, in any text, even if something is authored in 21st century uh, in Bangalore or in Delhi, that difference will be there in the text. So that is the kind of information that we tap and uh, arrive at this conclusion. It, has, uh, it is not uh, any kind of uh, uh, negation of the traditional reading of these texts. All the, all the data that you show about migration indicates migrations of royal families because of political considerations. Now, how does that translate to a linguistic shift which would require a, a larger population mm -hmm. to take it out of India? So, I want to bring it back to the original question. Yeah, so uh, that's a very important question. Uh, so, in my books, uh, I have not uh, very much focused on the linguistic Aspect. So, I think yeah, I will ask you to refer to Srikant Kalagiri's book where the, uh, the linguistic analysis of the languages, that is the entire Indo-European language family, including Sanskritam and uh, German and uh, uh, like uh, Germanic languages, Greek and uh, Anatolian, all these things are analyzed and the word by word comparison is uh, sort. So, to put it something short, uh, there are uh, inferences from the comparative mythology of uh, uh, India, Greece and uh, other European countries where which shows uh, India is the source of that uh, mythological elements and there are linguistic uh, the word uh, the nouns in the nouns and verbs in the wor words different words in the Indo-European family which also shows a linguistic uh, linguistically it shows a migration from India to uh, Europe and Central Asia I mean Iran uh, Central Asia and Europe. So, since my focus uh, was primarily geography, so I was corroborating uh, Talagiri's findings from a point of view of geography.